right. We're very excited to have my good friend Warren back. Uh, Warren was uh, one of our first guys to interview and gave us a lot of fantastic insights and wisdom that came into the first book, Ten Commandments of Investing, which our audience that follow the book and Warren will know talks about the investment principles, commandments of the world's greatest investment wizards. And we're inviting Warren back amongst uh, another 99 amazing investors and thinkers uh, that will hopefully give us uh, a lot of wisdom and content for our second book, which is the 10 commandments to generational wealth, a bit more practical and drilling down the specific asset classes and what specifically Warren himself is thinking and doing to create generational wealth for himself and for his next generation. Okay. All right, so Warren, welcome back. How, uh, what, what's the deal since the last probably 90, 18 months since we talked? Uh, well, there's a lot going on in my personal life and my, you know, my uh, business life. And then, you know, what's probably not new is I was probably heavily invested in Tesla when we talked last time, and I'm still heavily invested in Tesla now. Um, you know, as far as okay. investing goes, as far as investing goes, I am uh, a basically an all in, you know, there's there's little bits here and there that aren't Tesla, but you know, 90 to 99% Tesla, depending on which account you're talking about. So of your investable capital, personal slash family, you are 90% plus one stock, which is Tesla? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, uh, okay, so this, I wouldn't say it's normal. This is extremely understandable to me. This is not normal. Because obviously... <laughs> well, uh, it, it's totally understandable to me because I know you because we we are both very much fans of Tesla and Elon. But maybe for the benefits of some of the new followers, you know, why is this not normal? Why are you doing this? Sure, let me let me give a little bit of history. In two thousand, I I've been investing for probably thirty years or so, managing family portfolio or my own portfolio or both. And in 2013, I made my biggest mistake in investing. I bought Amazon stock, Amazon stock 13X in the time that I held it. And it was my biggest mistake because I didn't buy enough. And I went 2016 rolled around. And, and what happened was in 2013, I saw it. I got the Amazon story. I saw it and I thought I was early. I thought I understood the Amazon story before everyone else understood it. And, you know, Amazon was not making profits. It was, you know, PE ratio was infinite. You know, they had, I think they had a profitable quarter, but they had three unprofitable quarters. So they're, they had, they were essentially not making money and wall street didn't get Amazon and I did. And so I bought, I don't know, five or $10,000. I think it was $10,000 in Amazon stock and it 13 X. Right. And, and at a certain point I realized I saw it and I should have bought more. So in two, late 2015, I'd been following Tesla, SpaceX, you know, Elon's other companies for a while. And in late 2015, they landed the first orbital rocket booster. Falcon 9's first orbital rocket booster safely landed, I think, at Cape Canaveral. And that triggered in me, if they can do that, you know, what else can they do? And I started researching Tesla stock because SpaceX was not publicly traded, but Tesla was. I started researching more seriously and I started buying Tesla stock. I think it was February, 2016 was my first purchase of the stock. And then you just continue going along and I just kept buying more and more Tesla stock. And then at a certain point, I pretty much sold, over the course of time, I pretty much sold everything else and put everything into Tesla stock. Um, and it was, it's a, I would call it conviction investing that you get to a certain point where you realize this is it nothing is a better investment than this stock and um is it there's some risk I, I acknowledge there's some risk that something could go wrong but i balance the risk versus the the upside and the upside is so large that the risk which i view as minimal is trivial compared to the upside on a risk adjusted returns basis you see nothing better for generational wealth yeah, I mean, well, I should say it's not that there's no other company out there that might grow as much as Tesla's going to grow. It's just that I don't see it. And I've looked at a lot. I've, there's this whole game where people on the internet or YouTube will talk about, you know, they're looking, they're talking about what's the next Tesla. You know, Tesla had this big rise in, in share price over, let's say, 2016 to 2020 or 21 or whatever, where it went up dramatically. And I wrote a lot of that up. So I made a lot of, I generated a lot of wealth in Tesla stock, riding that rise up. So 
um, you'll see a YouTube video. You would see YouTube videos, you know, Palantir is the next Tesla or NVIDIA is the next Tesla. And I've looked at the companies that I thought were most credibly sold as the next Tesla. And I didn't, the like, Palantir is a really good example. I understand that Palantir has some success, but I don't see the growth story. With Tesla, I see the growth story and the growth story is shockingly good, right? And I just don't see another company out there that has the growth story that Tesla has. And I'm a big believer in growth investing. I'm not a value investor. Mm -hmm. I'm a, like, I mean, I think the concepts of value and growth don't really make sense. You invest where you think the best investment is. And I, and if I didn't have Tesla, I would probably have a diversified portfolio because I'm not aware of another company that's this compelling. But Tesla is so compelling as an investment. The, the growth story is so compelling. There's so many different angles to it. There's so many uh, opportunities for it to grow that I can't see selling a share of Tesla and putting it in something else. Yeah, I, no, I, I follow. I, I obviously follow you. I'm a fan of your your channels and your content as well as others. So if I'm reading you correctly, understanding correctly, um, let's take Tencent and let's take Apple, right? I, I see those two companies and perhaps Amazon. Uh, like Tesla having multiple trillion dollar TAM markets, right? They're just in a lot of different spaces. In, 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 in the case of Amazon and Apple, obviously they're a bit later stage. They're in multiple spaces to make trillion dollar, you know, they're just market leaders, and, but they're just uh, a bit more mature, a lot more mature. And then Tencent was it to me a generation wealth play until geopolitics and to the Chinese government sort of messed things up. <laughs> so now you've got this regulatory overlay. I used to hold a lot of 10 cent. Tesla, from what you're saying now and what I hear from you previously in your other uh, talks, has these multiple, multiple billion dollar, trillion dollar addressable markets where they are emerging, if not already out of leaders. So it's almost like investing in a late stage private equity VC fund where they're like number one in those spaces. So so it's almost diversified to me. Like, yes. would, would this be sort of, yeah, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, what I'd say, first of all, I, I have never looked at Tencent. I'm pretty familiar with Apple and Amazon. And the distinction is, and I, I wrote up, I, I made money on both of those stocks. I probably- yep. I had significant investments in Apple at certain points in time. I probably sold that too soon. Pretty clearly, I sold that too, too soon. I, I rode Amazon. My timing on Amazon was like really, really good. Like not intentional. It wasn't like I was planning to time it. I rode it up to a certain point. And then at a certain point, I said, okay, this wasn't like a, a, a decision directly to go into Tesla. But it was like, my Amazon is up too much. I'm going to sell half of it. and you know, Amazon probably doubled after that and I sold the rest, but um, I took that half and I bought most of that went into Tesla stock, not a conscious decision. It was like, let me sell. And then a week later, I looked, what am I going to do with this cash? And I bought Tesla stock. And although the Amazon stock doubled from there, the Tesla stock 5X from there. So even though I lost out on the gains from Amazon, I actually gained more with Tesla. Um, but when I look at Amazon and I look at Apple, I don't see the growth story anymore. So Apple, the growth story was really iPhone. And you just saw the, the Vision Pro goggles thing. And they actually pitched it as basically the next iPhone for Apple. If you if you watched the presentation, they were trying I did. to I did. They were trying to present it as okay, well, we've you know had this Mac OS and then we had iPad and then we got iPhone. And they're looking for the next hit that can, but Apple is such a behemoth now that the the win they have to deliver is so great. <clears throat> that I don't think it's, I don't think they can, first of all, I'm not sure that the goggle thing will work at all. I, I, I see it like it has some potential. Some people will buy it. It'll be a cool experience, but I don't see it selling billions of units. It's not going to be an iPhone. Um, and, and I don't see people being willing to walk outside with it. I could see people having it inside their home or I could see people using it in an office. I can't see somebody walking down the street with that or going into their gym. I, I see all sorts of problems with that in the long run. Um, so I, I, I think Apple is a good company that will grow at a modest rate in the future, but they're not going to 10x from where they are. Um, Amazon is a good company. They're probably going to have some more growth, but they're not going to 10x from where they are now. Tesla is going to more than 10x from where they are now, as I see it. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I see anything else 
that reaches out and grabs me that I need to look at and say, hey, what about this? I mean, I think in the AI space yeah. and the artificial intelligence space, you know, could Jet Chat GPT go there? Could and the problem with the AI space, and I, I use Chat GPT, GPT, I paid for the GPT-4 version. I think it's amazing. I use it. I'm really happy with it. I use Stable Diffusion for this backdrop. Um, I think that um, AI is really coming into its own and potentially very valuable. But picking the winner or winners is really, really hard to see who's yep. going to be the winner yep. in this space. And, and you know, it could be Tesla. Like Tesla is a player in this space. NVIDIA is a player in this space in the hardware side. Um, Elon's got X.AI coming along. There's, you know, I I think it's a really open. And how do you monetize ChatGPT to really make significant yeah, valuation? I can see that it becomes, a, a you know, $10 billion or $100 billion company maybe. If you can't invest in open AI anyway. I don't see it necessarily being a trillion dollar company. And if you get to that level, it's like, well, there's a lot of people jockeying for that space. And, you know, ultimately the model, the the concept of a generative AI model, I think that that's pretty much, there's, I don't see moats there. You know, Tesla has moats where their manufacturing is really hard to replicate. Their self-driving data and their self-driving uh hardware and and software approach really hard to replicate what they're doing with these not that it's not not that it's impossible just that's a big lift to emulate what tesla has done you know you basically need to put a few million cars out there with cameras and start collecting data and now how many years are you behind tesla um if if i'm correct that F fsd is going to go uh, you know achieve mm -hmm. genuine full self-driving and become a robo taxi network um bot you know where the bot is going there's lots of other companies making robots but they don't have the real world ai dojo that tesla is working on has a really good chance to like displace nvidia as the hardware of choice for ai training in the future i'm not saying it will i'm just saying i can see it right so when i look at the ai space like who else would you bet on and nvidia is a good bet but nvidia is already very highly valued what what's the growth story for nvidia and i think there's a short-term growth story for nvidia but long term i don't think there's a a moat that prevents other people from developing chips you know the hardware that supports ai training and ai inference that will really protect nvidia's long-term growth i think they'll grow i think it's a good company i just like what's the long-term growth story for nvidia i don't think it's that clear um that's one i lean yeah. like I, I probably want to look at nvidia again but i'm so persuaded of tesla's story and i you know i think you have something in in the about ten thousand hours you know you put ten thousand hours in and i have put so much time into tesla and i understand and i and i really go out of my way to look for criticism of tesla and try to understand the I'm looking for like somebody to persuade me that I'm wrong. And every effort to make Tesla look bad, it's just so obviously flawed. There's no, I have yet to see anything close to a credible argument about what Tesla is doing wrong. And the, the, the nonsense, you know, all oh, their batteries go on fire. No, no, gas cars burn up 11 times as often as electric vehicles. And they're not really in the lead. You know, I, and I think one of the things is there's, part of this is a big belief in Elon, not just Elon, but Elon's methods. And so um, I don't know if you saw SpaceX just landed a Falcon 9 booster for the 200th time, right? And no one yeah. else has even tried. So that was December 21, 2015 was the first Falcon 9 booster landing, safe landing, right? That's seven and a half years ago. No one else has even tried. No one is on, on the slate to try. So SpaceX is at least eight years ahead, maybe nine years ahead. Toyota just announced their plans for EVs and they're basically saying they're going to deliver a 300 mile range EV in like 2027, which Tesla did in 2018 or 2017 with the Model 3. Like, so Toyota is basically admitting they're nine years behind Tesla and battery. Toyota, which is, you know, I'm a fan of Toyota as a company, you know, historically, I think they make good cars in general, but they basically admitted they're nine years behind Tesla and EVs. And I don't really see, and then you get to like the self-driving and you, you, you can look around with a telescope and you'll never see whoever's number two because nobody's even close. Um, so so they, have, they have these moats and like, 
does does open ai have a moat i'm not sure that they have a moat there's certain advantages that the large players have in terms of having large compute resources and access to large data sets but that's not limited to like three companies there's probably 20 companies that probably have access to that level of compute and that level of data so and then it's not clear that you won't be able to do significant improvements in generative ai with less compute and less data i, I i'm not convinced that i know the story is you need the large compute and you need the large data sets but yep. i'm not convinced that somebody isn't going to solve that problem fairly soon and you'll be able to do things with small data sets and fairly small amounts of compute. And also compute yeah. is just getting more and more available over time. <laughs> Warren, this is this is great stuff. I, I, I like you to kind of dig a bit deeper. So, so the headlines always what happened yesterday, what happened today, right? Uh, and I think the mainstream, including Wall Street, probably recognize Tesla as a leader in cars, really quite recently, depending on which analyst, six six to twelve months, right? No, and obviously, the, I, would last, the last, I would say the last week or two. They, they figured <laughs> well, it out in the last week of, or two. No, no. I, so I see there's two two major things right now that Tesla has proven that I think has won over the, and I'm lumping mainstream with Wall Street because I've I for for whatever reasons they're just very short term, right? Uh, so I think. The recognition that Tester has won the car race, EV car race, certainly the hardware side, is a bit longer. Not that long, depending on who it is, six months, two years. And in the last couple of weeks, we also won, we, Tesla, won uh, charging. Right? They, own, they own charging, the whole platform. And then if you look deeper, it's really not just charging, it's the entire software stack, most likely. Okay. So yeah. I think I think the market is recognizing that, and you share that in the year-to-date price. What I want to ask you is not that. It's more of... On a ten-year view, maybe in five-year view, right? Where do you, how would you rank of all these different TAMs, these trillion-dollar TAMs that Tesla is in? How would you rank them? What's number one you see in five years? I would say, I would say, what, what? I would say there's two different things to think about: how likely are they to okay. happen, and how big are they? So, okay. So the one that I think will happen without question, like ninety-plus percent likelihood of happening, is what I call the battery revenue model, that Tesla okay. will, Tesla, if you look at a, a, a typical Tesla product, let's take a, I'm gonna I'm gonna name a hypothetical Tesla Model 3. This Model 3 doesn't really exist, but a hypothetical Tesla Model 3, which is a, a sedan that has a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack and costs $30,000. It's sold for a 30, no Tesla is sold for as low as $30,000 base price, but it's, we're, we're, we're making up a story. Okay. This is this is yeah. To, yeah. This okay. just to get to a simple number. The simple number I'm trying to get to is five hundred dollars in revenue per kilowatt hour of product. So it could be a model three that costs thirty thousand dollars and has a six to sixty kilowatt hour battery pack. The model three that has a sixty kilowatt hour battery pack probably sells for thirty five or forty thousand. So the number is actually bigger than this, but I'm just using a simple number of five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour in revenue. A Tesla mega pack has a roughly four megawatt hour pack and sells for $2 million, that works out to $500 a kilowatt hour. Most of Tesla products are more than $500 a kilowatt hour, um, but it's just a simple oversimplification to say, let's imagine that everything Tesla sells averages out to $500 a kilowatt hour. And this is pretty close to accurate. It's really more like six, recently it's been more like 600, but you can anticipate the price will decline or whatever. So then you ask yourself the question, okay, how many kilowatt hours, megawatt hours, gigawatt hours, terawatt hours of products will Tesla sell in let's say 2030, okay? 2030 is a nice, we could use 2033, you would get a bigger number, but I'm just using 2030 because that's the year I've been focusing on and the year that Tesla has talked about a lot. So let's suppose, I, I, I think you can get the number as high as six terawatt hours, which is 6,000 gigawatt hours, 6 million megawatt hours, you know, 6 billion kilowatt hours. Um, you could get as high as six terawatt hours, but let's just say it's three terawatt hours in 2030, which is 20 million cars and a whole bunch of energy storage devices. Okay, the 20 million cars yeah. is is a terawatt hour and the energy storage devices, it's probably like 1.2 terawatt hours of cars and 1.8 terawatt hours of, of battery storage, but that's something along the ballpark of what you're doing. So if it's three terawatt hours and it's $500 a kilowatt hour, that's $1.5 trillion in revenue. 
Okay, and Tesla's revenue this year will be about 100 billion. So it's like a 15x in revenue in seven years. Just okay, that's the okay. simplest, easiest one to see. Now, maybe it's only two terawatt hours, right? And you're only a trillion dollars in revenue. You're only a 10x in seven years in revenue. That's still pretty good, right? And you're saying that's the most likely? That's the one that like, I don't... As a... It's sort of like, you know, barring like some global thermonuclear war, some massive catastrophe, it's hard to see how that doesn't happen. There's, there's okay. challenges along the way. There's engineering challenges. There's supply chain challenges. But if you... Okay. If you pay attention to Tesla, you know they're pretty well prepared for all the supply chain issues. They're building their own lithium refinery. They've got contracts for lithium. They've got contracts for nickel. Um, the the lithium iron phosphate batteries, you know, there's the only challenge there is lithium, right? Because the iron and, and phosphate, the, the the components of a lithium iron phosphate battery are abundant already. The, the nickel-based cells, yeah. you have the nickel issue, you might have cobalt, or I don't think manganese is really a problem either. So there's a lot of resources available in the supply chain. And Tesla is very clear, if you watched Investor Day, they have like a whole team working on supply chain that's looking, you know, years ahead to secure their supply chain. So that one is okay. like, uh, not to say that it is guaranteed, that, it's very likely to happen. And that would be bigger than making cars themselves? It would it's it's combining cars and battery storage devices, power wall, mega pack. Uh, uh, so they would be selling the batteries to other makers, essentially. No, no, no. Hence the TAM no. is bigger. No. no, no, no. They're selling cars that have batteries in them, and they're selling energy storage mm -hmm. devices that have batteries in them. They're okay. The batteries are coming from Tesla's own manufacturing and from suppliers like CATL and LG Chem and Panasonic. But no, the, the Powerwall is a product that Tesla sells at significantly okay. more than $500 a kilowatt hour. The Mega Pack is a product that they are selling in substantial volume now at $500 a kilowatt hour. The cars, gotcha. gotcha. the cars are all selling for more than $500 a kilowatt hour. Um, they've got a next generation car coming out of Giga Mexico and elsewhere. They've got Cybertruck coming in a few months. Um, Cybertruck will almost will likely be more than $500 a kilowatt hour. We'll see what happens with that. But, you know, you can, you can tweak and you could say $400 a kilowatt hour and you could say two terawatt hours. You still get, you know, outsized numbers. But that's the sort of like base scenario of Tesla's success is they produce a high volume of products containing batteries and they sell them at in the ballpark of $500 a kilowatt hour. And you see where you gotcha, get to. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so that's the... So, that's, so sorry, that's, sorry. That's no I just want to... Uh, let me just kind of rephrase this a follow up question. I, my, my question was um, Tesla obviously will continue to make and sell Tesla branded cars, which need all the systems you've talked about. Uh, with the Ford and GM, all these announcements uh, <laughs> on the EV charging side, but I see, as you see, that eventually that leads to batteries, that leads, leads to software, right? So, sort of being the Android of EV space, is that a um, bigger, like selling, selling that white label? right solution hardware and software and batteries do you see that as a bigger market versus just tesla's no. own products I, I, or are they the I, same i have not modeled tesla selling batteries to other companies i haven't modeled tesla selling drivetrains to other companies it's my impression that tesla is going to help other companies with like supercharging uh hardware and software at no at no profit to tesla other than the profit they generate from the superchargers there is the story of tesla's going to make money on superchargers and I don't think that story is that big. My friend Larry Goldberg was speaking today, and he thinks that's potentially a hundred billion dollar TAM. Just the supercharge, you know. Basically, well, Tesla's. Own, I think. Own, yeah. Farley has said in one of the interviews that uh, they're white labeling the app, right? And, and I think both, even Mary Barra, I think has alluded to this is first of potential other partnerships, and and so th there's a lot of buzz I I've heard about software next. Right, because the ice guys just can't make software. Yeah, and if you're talking I, about software, it's just not the OS. It's also potentially the autopilot and FST at some point, and then certainly batteries should be included in that. So it's not to me. It's, it potentially is it is it right to assume that it's more than just EVs, EV charging? Right. I, I haven't modeled it yet. I certainly think you could make a case for Tesla will become a software provider um, to all other major car makers. And and you know the problem is the typical car maker today has you know 
a hundred or so software providers covering every all these you know crazy aspects of the car. I don't think that that's happening anytime soon because the challenge of going from all these suppliers to one integrated software provider from Tesla, um, you know, and do they, you know, there's a certain point where they don't really want to rely on Tesla for everything. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a challenge. Do they have to slap a Tesla inside label on their cars? You know, they, uh, you know, do they really want their cars charging at a Tesla branded supercharger? Well, there's challenges there. Okay. Let, let, let me, let me say it this way. You, you... Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. I saw Jim Farley and then Mary Barra's announcement that they will be using Tesla superchargers as essentially an admission from two leading CEOs in the industry that Tesla is the clear winner in the EV race and that the competition is on for either being number two or number three or surviving at all. I, I think the challenge I for agree. the I agree. The challenge for the existing car makers is is, you know, can somebody be successful enough to survive and be, you know, Tesla's not going to provide all the vehicles. There's going to be room for one or two other providers. Can anybody survive long enough to position themselves to be the number two supplier of vehicles or the number three supplier of vehicles? And and I think Ford, I, I think Jim Farley gets that. I'm not sure Mary Barra gets it. I think Jim Farley gets it. That's the goal. Okay. We're not trying to be Tesla anymore. We're just trying to ride along on their ecosystem and be number two. And that's being number two would be great. Like that would be a success for Ford. They're not number two now. Lauren, ha so I tell me if this is correct. I, I don't see EVs or as a hardware play. It's it's a software play, right? And, and, and so, so have you seen any other hmm. EV or potential EV maker uh, that has any software that makes sense? Certainly not VW. Um, I'm right. not, I don't I don't know enough about Lucid. Like Lucid Motors claims they have great software. I don't know whether they do or not. I don't think they do. Rivian, I don't know what their software solution is. I don't know about the Chinese car makers like Neo and uh, Li and Xpeng. I don't know mm -hmm. what they're. I don't know enough about but those companies. Tie tie this back to self driving though, right? It, it, so yeah. to me, I'm I'm looking at the entire stack, right? So. So if, I know you believe this because I believe this is is the the ecosystem is not just the in car OS that's a part of it and, and Tesla does that really well. It's also the mapping, so they're not relying on Google or Apple Maps; they have their own mapping. But to me, the data set from self driving, there's nobody that comes close. So even if Rivian does a great software in car software, they're gonna be a massive disadvantage to me. A unbeatable disadvantage if they don't have any type of software, right? So to me, eventually the ICE guys will start using a white label Tesla app as Ford will do, as Jim will do, but they're going to have to be reliant on the car OS and then they don't have any self-driving, right? They, they, they come up to the supercharger. I'm driving my, my X, my Cybertruck, and I'm raving about my FSD. They're going to feel inadequate. They're going to upgrade. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't see I don't see any other play except as you said that China has other players and China itself is big enough, right? But X China, this to me is already one. Yeah. But let, let me let me address like, the software like, point. So there's did, two there, there's two that, software angles here. Software angle number one is sort of like the software to run the car or the software in the app for the for the driver. And I don't I I'm, I just haven't modeled it. I don't think that's a big deal. The big deal is the self-driving, and and let me take okay. you to the second. Yep. Let me take you to the second model. The second model is, let's suppose Tesla actually delivers self-driving, and we enter a world of robo taxis. And here's really simple math again. I gave you my you know three terawatt hours and five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. I'm going to give you a different simple math, which is to massively oversimplify the way I think the robo taxi space will be. Let's assume Tesla builds a fleet for itself of ten million robo taxis. And each robo taxi generates fifty thousand dollars in profit, gross profit a year. That's five hundred billion dollars in gross profit a year for that fleet of ten million vehicles. I think it will actually be significantly bigger than this, and and the revenue will be higher. But just to massively oversimplify, that would be five hundred billion dollars in gross profit in twenty thirty. Okay, so what was Tesla's gross profit in twenty twenty two? I don't know, twenty billion. 
So you're talking about a 25X in gross profit, and that's only for the robo-taxi portion of the company, yeah. right? You're still yeah. going to have yeah. more from the, the selling all the vehicles and selling all the, the energy storage and other, other angles. So that, and, and Zach Kirkhorn was asked about software in, I forget which earnings call. And, you know, will Tesla make money from software in this way or that way? And Zach was pretty straightforward. You know, we might make some money from software here or there, but RoboTaxi is really it. Like everything else is dwarfed by, the, the value generated by a RoboTaxi network is, you know, in Elon called it insanely gigantic, right? The value generation, like the 500 billion in gross profit I just said, like that assumes it's only 10 million, 10 million vehicles and it's $50,000 a vehicle. What if it's a hundred million vehicles and they only make $20,000 of profit per vehicle, right? Now it's 2 trillion in gross profit instead of 500 billion in gross profit. So you can get like really outlandish numbers and you don't have to go very far in the future to get them. And by the way, these numbers are small compared to Tesla bot, which is the next model, right? If, if okay. op- so, sorry, so, so before you get there, so can you just summarize that, you know, you, you talked about the energy solutions, you talked about Tesla bot, and obviously sells. So are these the three buckets that you, you're now saying are the top three bucket in a 10 year view? The three models. How that you, I re- how? Right. The three models I rely on are the battery revenue model, sort of my base case. And the, mm-hmm. the robo taxi model is the somewhat optimistic case, although I still think it's much more likely than 50 percent that Tesla will get there. I, it's 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 basically just replacing Uber and Lyft. But so price competitive that when you get to a certain level, people stop bothering to own cars. The 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 TAM, the to- total addressable market. If you're able to reduce the price of a ride below about seventy cents a mile, maybe even below a dollar a mile, which isn't is fairly easy to accomplish. The average American spends seventy cents a mile to own a car, so a large number of people will just decide I'm not going to bother owning a car anymore. I'll just have an app on my phone, and when I need a car, I'll press the button, and a car will come get me. And will drop me off at the and there's there's a people think it'd be inconvenient to use robo taxis. It's actually much more convenient than owning a car because it drops you off at the front. You don't have to park a quarter mile away and walk in. It picks you up at the front. You don't, you don't get wet. You don't slip on ice looking for your car. Um, you don't have to clean the, the snow off your car. You never have to take it to a car wash. You never have to get the tires replaced. You never have to, you know, all the maintenance issues. You never have to charge it. You never have to fill it up with gas. So that the total addressable market there is much, much larger than 10 million robo taxis. It's a hundred million or more. Um, and then, so that's, that's model number two is the robo taxi model. And model number three is Tesla bot, which it's hard to measure that one, but I have some approximations, which the, the story I like to tell is because when I was young, I worked at Burger King. So take a fast food restaurant that has an imaginary 10, 10 worker staff okay you could make it five and you get the same story but let's just say some small business that has 10 workers and it's not that the bot does everything that one worker does but it does enough that you only need to hire nine workers to do the rest so the employer is now hiring nine people instead of 10 people and you've saved them and the the bot works two shifts so it works let's say 80 hours a week and you're basically saving payroll for one employee who might, let's say costs you $20 an hour times 4,000 hours a year, you've saved $80,000 a year for 10 years, let's say that the bot lasts on on just not having to hire one more employee. Okay, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying. There's a lot of reasons why the story is actually much better than this, but what does it cost Tesla to make a bot? $10,000, $5,000? you're going to generate $800,000 in value for something that costs $10,000 to build or Mm -hmm. $5,000 to build. And the total addressable market for it is everyone. Like everyone could have a bot. Some people might have two or 10. You can imagine on the moon or Mars, you would probably have a ratio Mm -hmm. of at least 10 bots per person because the bots can go outside and you can't, right? So there's things that need to be done. You have the bots do them. And as the bots get out there, generate more data, get more training, you improve your algorithms. The bots are capable of doing, every year the bots are capable of doing more. So initially, like a really simple use case that I think everyone can understand is you have some sort of secure facility that you want to protect and you have security guards walking around the perimeter. Instead of having five security guards walking around the perimeter, 
you have two security guards that are sort of central and you have 10 Tesla bots walking around the perimeter, right? They're not picking anything up. They're not touching anything. They're not intervening. They're just walking around the perimeter. And if they see something, they relay their video signal back to the central branch. And they, they interpret and they're able to evaluate and they say, okay, that's a squirrel. I don't need to worry about that. Wait a minute, that's a human. We should look at this, right? Um, that's probably a $20 an hour cost of the employer that you're solving. And that's like really, really simple. That's not manipulating objects. You can get to the point where you're like taking out the trash or mopping the floor or mm -hmm. cleaning mm -hmm. the toilet. There's, the, you know, flipping burgers. There's so many things that you might have a bot do that are relatively straightforward, simple tasks. And over time, as, as you train the bot, it learns to do more things. You know, you talk to women, like I don't, I, mean, I don't see what the big deal is. I fold laundry all the time, but a bot that was able to fold laundry, like some people think that's the end all. I just did my laundry today and I, I don't understand why people are so excited about folding laundry. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me, but people get excited about folding laundry. Like, cause that's a hard, <laughs> task. that's a hard task for a bot to do. Right. But you can just see that there's a series of things that you will have bots doing over time, mowing your lawn, you know, from, from our, our personal standpoint, you have a bot mow your lawn. You have a bot, you know, wash your car, walk the dog, who knows, you know, there's, there's a million yeah. things, you know, go to school and, and walk the kid home. There's, there's a, a wide variety of things you might have a bot do for you. And the potential market for that is so big. So let's imagine they only sell a, like you can see where you could get to a hundred million bots a year and let's say, okay, we're going to generate $800,000 in value for this employer. We'll charge a hundred thousand dollars for the bot. So the employer is thrilled to get the bot for $100,000 and Tesla's getting 10 X what it costs them to build it. Right. So a hundred million bots times a hundred thousand dollars, you just start getting to crazy numbers there. I think that's $10 trillion a year in revenue. Yeah. And, and it's almost all profit. It's like ninety percent margin. So that's what, you know. What, what's to? I get the TAM. I'm excited about the potential. Is there a moat for the Tesla bot? And, and what 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 do you think that is? It's the same moat as FSD. That they are. Um, I mean, manufacturing is part of it. That they figured out they're they're going to figure out a way to manufacture bots. Like the moat isn't there yet, right? Because they they don't really have a viable product yet. Right, but they are man they are getting ready to manufacture bots, design with the plan to manufacture them in high volume. So you, you look at people point to Boston Dynamics and say, "Oh, look, Boston Dynamics bots do so much more." Yeah, but Boston Dynamics bots are much more expensive, and they don't make them in volume. They're not going to sell. You know, you don't have a use for a Boston Dynamics bot in your home or your small business right now, but you could see the use cases for Tesla bot already. So. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the secret is what they're going to do is they're going to make a high, volume, a high volume of bots early and they're going to generate more training data. And, and then their dojo is going to, Project Dojo is going to come online. We didn't even get into, that. there's another model there, which is AI training as a service that Tesla is building their own um, hardware for AI training that would basically replace the NVIDIA clusters that they use. And if that's successful enough and they have plans to build a lot of them, Right. You could see them selling AI training as a service. I'm not even getting into that, but you get this army of uh, army is probably the wrong word. You get a, a high volume of bots that are out there doing things and then they're generating data and you're learning from the data and you're training and they're getting better and better and better. That, you know, no one else is close to you would need to build your fleet of bots. You would need to have cameras on the bots. You would need to have the right chips on the bots because the bots already have the FSD hardware from uh, the current cars. Yeah. Right. Warren, would you say the mm -hmm. software, obviously, I agree with you, you're going to leverage the FSD technology and, and existing for the bot. Would you say, I, I think so, would you say it's actually easier to find and get Tesla bot applications? Yeah. Because you're not driving at 50 miles an hour, right? You're, you're, you're moving boxes, you're delivering parcels, you may be walking a dog or picking up trash. Those to me are not dangerous tasks that seem um, to me, not being an engineer, but to me, less difficult to get approval or whatnot to be useful versus getting full, uh, full self-driving. Like, I think certainly the, so walking, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think that certainly the walking mm -hmm. the perimeter story is like really, really 
obvious because you're not you don't even yeah i think I, the one thing that fsd and the cars doesn't do is it doesn't manipulate objects the big jump for bot from FSD in the car is the bot has to pick objects up. It has to move them. It has to put them down. It has to manipulate objects. And that's something that there's no base level of training for that yet. They have to train on all that stuff. And there's all a whole variety of things that it's going to need to learn to do. And I don't have the perspective right now to say, how long does it take to train them to do something significantly useful? And I want to add, sorry, there's one other thing I want to add, which is, mm. We've got the real world AI of self-driving and of, um, sorry, the real world AI of self-driving and of bot walking around the world and manipulating objects. What we don't have yet with Tesla is the, the AI of like large language models, of taking mm -hmm. large language models and being able to communicate with the bot and the bot understanding what you're saying, being able to communicate with the car and the car genuinely understanding you know you know wide open speech um and you know elon's got a new company x.ai i think one of the purposes of that company will be to develop its own large language models so that tesla and spacex and Neuralink and you know tesla's other, elon's other companies will be able to use that um that kind of large language model diffusion model um, forms of ai to enable more value in tesla bot and the cars and whatever else have you done research talk to anybody that are experts how feasible is it to download your brain and install it in test and optimus yeah i don't I, I think we're a long way from that um neuralink, neuralink. I, I think Neuralink is on the path to that. It's it's clearly the plan. If you if you've never read it, Elon has referred to the uh, the Culture series by Ian Banks. It's a series of novels, and there's a there's a um, a technology that's features science fiction, right? But there's a technology in there called Neural Lace, which seems an awful lot like Neuralink when you read it and you see what Neuralink is doing. Hmm. Um, I don't think we know yet how feasible that's going to be, but it seems pretty straightforward that we should be able to do that. Um, I'm not sure that you're going to want to put your consciousness onto a bot. I, I, I'll tell you where the application that I think it makes the most sense is I'm very focused on SpaceX and exploring the, the, the solar system and then ultimately exploring the galaxy. When you want to go to another solar system, this meat, this meat package is not going to survive a, a, a 50 year trip to another solar system. We're not we're not going to be meaningfully capable as humans of traveling to other stars anytime soon. But if you're able to upload your consciousness to a cloud and download it onto a bot and basically put your consciousness in stasis while you're traveling the 50 year boring journey to another star system, then, yeah, I think it could make sense to have bots have human consciousnesses on them um, so that when you get to another star system, you will essentially be visiting another star system yourself yeah and and you know it doesn't uh, just have I, to be one you could you could have your consciousness on a hundred bots or a thousand bots and your consciousness could be operating in cloud you know in various cloud activities as well it, it, your consciousness could be disembodied and still doing things there's a, a variety of ways that could play out but that's that's really that's not part of my investing story like i i would like to invest in Neuralink. i would like to invest in the boring company and spacex i made the judgment because um, I've had a couple of opportunities to invest in these companies. It's like, well, do I want to sell $100,000 in Tesla stock and put it into one of these funds that's investing in a fund that's invested in, you know, one of these companies' stock? And the the fees and the transactions costs are so high and the, the future prospects are there, but I'm not convinced they're that much better than Tesla's future prospects. Like the one I focused on the most was the boring company. But it's just it's really hard to buy into companies that are pub that are not publicly traded. So I, I just tend to focus on Tesla because it's publicly traded and it's accessible. I do think the growth potential makes for sense, sense. the growth potential for Neuralink is insane. The growth potential for for Boring Company. I don't know if you've heard me talk about the Boring Company before, but um, you, you know what it is, right? They've got tunnels in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, for over a hundred years, the Russians and Chinese have talked about bridging the Bering Strait. Well, what if Boring Company did a tunnel system that connected China to Los Angeles through the Bering Strait? And then 
you run a, a, a line along the Arctic Circle over to Northern Europe. Um, hmm. You know, you run a line from Shanghai down to India, and you could you could basically connect 80 to 90 percent of the world's population by a tunnel. And all of a sudden, you have eliminated all trans-Pacific cargo shipping and all transatlantic air travel. And trans-Pacific air travel, you know, wow. all, all wow. air travel, tr all trans-Oceanic, Pacific or Atlantic cargo shipping and travel, because it would be so much cheaper in a boring company cargo tray going through a boring company tunnel than it is putting it on a ship. You have to get to a port. You got to put it on something else when you get there. Um, there's real potential to make the world a lot smaller and a lot more efficient and, you know, really better for the environment as well. Because if you stop shipping an airplane, if you dramatically reduce shipping and air travel, um, you're actually doing a lot for the environment as well. Wow. That, that one's new to me. How many miles is that to build that tunnel? 6,000 6, miles. Uh, if you okay. wanted to do four tunnels, you'd want to do four tunnels, two cargo tunnels and two hyperloop tunnels. So yeah. you, you would do four tunnels. It'd be 24,000 miles of tunnel. Call it $4 million a mile. You're at $100 billion. And you've just solved, you've just, you've just replaced all trans-Pacific cargo shipping, all trans-Pacific air wow. travel, all trans. And then how, you, how, how fast... How fast are they digging now? Uh, I don't know how fast they're digging now. I think they're somewhere like in the ballpark of a, of a a mile a week or something like that. But I think their okay. their their longer term plans are to make um, tunneling significantly faster. I, I, it's really less about how fast they're tunneling and more about how many machines they have and how much does it cost per mile, because it doesn't really matter how fast the machine is. You just build more of them. But if you can get to faster machines, what, what ultimately happens is you're really lowering the cost. The real goal sure. is to lower the cost. Okay. okay, so let's come back to Tesla. Warren, you're coaching me how to tell my three teenage daughters if they, you know, they make a thousand dollars this summer and it's, uh, being a waitress, a part-time job. They said, Daddy, where should we invest this? I said, of course, Tesla and, and hold it forever. You, you're going to get a minute or two of their attention. How would you put it all together for me? Yeah, I mean, I well, I think first, I don't think investing in Tesla is for everyone. You have to, number one, you have to see it. So you have to dive in and really understand the story. And number two, mm -hmm. you have to recognize that investing in Tesla is a roller coaster. So, you know, the peak price, you know, current, you know, post split price was like $400 a share. It dropped almost to $100 a share. It's now at 200 and I don't know, 50 or $260 a share. And I know people who are really stressed out by the ups and downs of the stock price. I was not stressed at all. Like I, I, like 90 plus percent of my net worth is in Tesla stock and I wasn't stressed at all about it because I wasn't planning on selling this week, right? I don't have any short-term need to sell the stock. So it goes up, it goes down. I'm not worried about it. I'm really looking out to the future. So uh, there are people who can't handle the roller coaster. They, they need some level of stability and it's not for them. So if you are thinking I'm investing this money and I don't plan on touching it for 10 years. And I'm not even going to watch the daily stock price. I'm just going to put my money in there, mm -hmm. and forget about it. And I'll, I'll read Tesla news and I'll see what they're doing with the company, but I'm just not really going to think about it. Um, if you are the kind of person, and, and the other thing I should say, by the way, is um, I'm very, I'm very um, critical of people who advocate buying on margin or playing options games. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna confess that I own five options to buy Tesla stock. So I I do have five call options on Tesla <laughs> stock, but it's like, it's less than 1% of my portfolio. It was just a silly play. Um, and I'm currently up significantly, but that's just, as far as I'm concerned, it's blind luck. Um, if you play those games, the roller coaster gets a lot harder, right? If the stock falls, you know, 50%, and you're on margin, you might get a margin call and you might be forced to sell and you lose a lot. So if you don't play margin games and you don't play options games and you just buy the stock and hold it and you don't worry about it, and over time you accumulate, okay, I got four shares, okay, I got 10 shares, I got 50 shares, I got a couple hundred shares. If you play that game and you're patient, you'll get there. Um, and I, I also think like, will the, I, I see the stock currently trading at, let's say, $250 a share. I see the stock easily reaching $5,000 a share in the future, right? But it's not a smooth ride. It could be, you know, staying below $300 a share for another year and then suddenly jump up to $1,000 a share 
and then dipping back down to 500. You know, and I don't know the Tesla's growth plan is to grow fast early or grow fast late, right? So they have this Giga Mexico that they're building to build the next generation vehicle. Um, do they have um, plans to build a second factory right away or a third and fourth factory right away? Or is the plan, let's build Giga Mexico first. And once it's built, okay, then we're going to build two more and they're going to be two, two more after that. Like, what is Tesla's growth path? And I don't know the answer to that question. And I think they know, but we don't know. Is, is the growth going to happen quick, you know, steady, or is it going to be like slow and then fast, or is it going to be fast and then slow? It's, it's hard to see that path. Mm. Yeah. It, yeah. My, my gut hunch is Tom Zhu, who's a Chinese guy working for Tesla, had said they're going to build more than one factory at a time because they built Berlin and Texas at the same time. So for me, it would make sense for Tesla to build three or four factories at the same time. But that yeah. doesn't mean you're going to do it. Yeah, I, we just posted, he had a great quote. He, I think he said something like, I'd love to get some sleep, but this job is so damn interesting. Tom Jews at that. Uh, <laughs> it yep. really, it, it testifies to the culture. People are doing it for, for that. Um, key man risk. So that to me is the biggest risk. All the stuff you talked about is heavily relying on Elon. I don't agree with that. I think the key man risk is, okay. I think Optimus is probably more reliant on Elon. Um, the the robo taxi is already baked in. The The battery revenue model is already baked into the company. Drew Baglino, um, Zach Kirkhorn, Tom Zhu, um, the uh, Lars Moravi, the team is already in place, you know, cyber truck, the next generation vehicle, all that stuff's already baked in. Um, what happens with Tesla and Elon companies in general is there comes this moment where a big bet needs to be made and Elon can make those big, big bets. And so there might be some future game changing thing that's available that won't happen if Elon's not there. Right. I mean, I, but, you know, as far as I can see, Robo taxi is already baked in. I think Optimus is pretty much baked in. Like the team knows what they're doing. Mm. It would have to be that that Elon disappears, and whoever comes in as CEO actively um, sabotages the company's prospects. You would have to go out of your way to stop them from achieving what they're what they're set to achieve. And and I I have my own gut hunch by the way that Kimball will take over the company if Elon vanishes because Kimball would pro Elon owns a lot of shares in the company. And Kimball would probably manage the trust, the, the backup plan for Elon's trust that owns the stock. It's the Elon Musk family trust. Most likely the backup plan is that Kimball takes control of the shares. Wow. Okay. That's also, I mean, who else would you, fresh who, idea. Else would, what? who else would you put in charge of, of the stock? And, and it's pretty obviously Kimball and Kimball knows the company has been on the board or he was on the board for a long time. Um, he's with the company at the very beginning. He knows the mission. And he knows that the team is solid and he knows to trust the team. Would he make the game-changing decision that Elon would make? Probably not. But would he sabotage the company? No way. So the danger is you I get a John you. Scully oh, in and the John, you get somebody like John Scully, you know, who gets in the way. And I don't think we're going to have that issue. Is there a clear leader number two to you? Is that Tom? Is that Zach? Who, who, who would that be? I think it's either Zach or Drew Baglino. Zach Kirkhorn or Drew Baglino. I don't think it's Tom. I, I think if you watched the investor day presentation, Zach sat on one side and, and Drew sat on the other and Tom was down several seats. So mm -hmm. I think, and I think Zach and, and Drew work really well together and it probably would be Zach because he speaks wall street and he does get the engineering side. Um, and Drew would just, Drew, Drew would run the, the business side of the company, the, the engineering side of the company. I mean, and, and Zach would run the business side of the company. I mean, and that seems pretty straightforward to me, but you know, that doesn't mean it, it happens, you know, you can get messy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if if Kimball comes in or somebody else comes in, you know, it's not a problem. Like, my gut hunch would be maybe Drew doesn't want to be CEO and Zach does. Just like gut, like slight gut read that Zach would be more interested yeah. in the job. Yeah. 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 They're, both, they're both super bright. They're both super hardworking. They both get the company at every level. So. And there's also... Uh, what or, J.B. Straubel. J.B. Straubel is another wild card. He was just appointed the Tesla board. He was co-founder with Elon. I don't see it being him. I think it's Drew. I, I like. I'm. I actually have a T-shirt. Baglino fan club. 
Like I'm really a Drew Bagnuso <laughs> fan. I've seen him speak quite a few times. I met him in person once. I think Drew is, you know, much he's already people know he's smart, but he actually is smarter than people realize. And his the breadth of knowledge he has about the company. Same thing with Zach, by the way. I think Zach's breadth of knowledge about the company is also really, really wide. Like they know everything that's going on in the company. I think that's part of Elon's strategies. Everybody has to know everything. So this is uh this is really good stuff for me. Uh, you know, like you, I follow quite a bit, certainly not as much as you. So the succession thing gives me a lot of comfort. I didn't know what you just told me. Uh, the the boring title bearing straight thing is very, I got to think more about that. That's incredible if it's true. Um, well, I'm not, the battery I, estimate. I've yeah. never talked to anybody at the boring company who said we're going to do that. I just think it's a really straight. No, I understand. Story. I understand. It's really yeah. obvious that this would be very successful. And the challenge with the Bering Strait idea is you have to go through Russia. And my whole theory, and you you know more about China and Russia, <laughs> than probably. My whole theory is yeah. that the Chinese leadership would just, they would take care of Putin. They would just work it out with Putin. They would, they would, they would buy him off. Right. They, mm. you know, Putin would be difficult. Whoever's running Russia would be difficult. They would, they would make it worth Putin's while to make it work. And hopefully by the time we get there, we're not in the middle of some sort of proxy war in, in Ukraine or whatever. And we're, and we're, and we're like, I don't yeah. like, just want to be clear, by the way, there's all this geopolitical rivalry between the United States and Russia and the United States and China. I think all of that is completely unnecessary that I'm not saying the Chinese government is perfect, but I don't think the U.S. government is perfect. And I would rather we just got along with each other and traded with each other. I don't, I don't think there's any value. Is there going to be some conflict over Taiwan at some point? Yeah, we're not going to solve that problem. I honestly think the Chinese are patient enough that the mainland China is patient enough that they'll just wait until the time is right. They don't need to do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This idea that they're just going to suddenly invade Taiwan, like, why would they do that? It's just not in their mm -hmm. nature to just suddenly invade some country. They'll just be patient and wait for the right moment and it'll happen somehow or other. But I don't think we need to worry about that. But we play all these power games and I think that's all unnecessary. And I think the, the, the gain from partnering with China to do a boring bearing project um, and partnering with China and Russia to deliver that kind of value to humanity is so much greater than our arguments over the South China Sea or yeah. this island yeah. over here. Yep. Yeah, we have all these, yeah, that, that's like, that's like, it's like 19th century strategic politics. Like we're in the 21st century, we're, we're looking towards the 22nd century. Let's stop thinking about, you know, big power, you know, power politics and start thinking, how do we make the world better for people? And such an obvious game changer for making the world a better place is the tunnel system and, and you know, Starship flying people from, I heard, oh, I don't, I don't know if you caught this one. There was some podcast, I think it was the All In Pod, and they were talking to a guy who was, I think, on SpaceX's board. And they were talking about cargo, using Starship as a cargo method for shipping from, you know, Asia to the United States, replacing air cargo. Right? Yeah. Like, it's going to be much more cost effective and faster than flying cargo in a plane to fly it in a Starship. And that one, you don't have to worry about, you know, the humans having to deal with zero G and, you know, high G forces. So there's many stories about how we're going to make the world a better place for a lot of people. And I just wish we could look at the future and say, hey, we've got a lot of great things happening coming in the future. Let's let's make things good. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end it, Warren. I, I don't know if you, you, you noticed when you were talking about, you know, uh, boring tunnel and going to Mars, I, I was smiling uh, because this conversation that we just had about going to Mars, boring tunnel. I think five years ago, maybe even three years ago, I would not have taken it seriously, right? And you would say the majority of people that are not following this are not gonna take this seriously. But given how much Elon and his team have achieved, you know, reusable rockets, if he solved that problem, to me, FSD is probably easier for him, right? right. Uh, they're, they're, they're challenging it, problems I, in different ways but the, yeah the, 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 it's just incredible that he solved problems like that so so right now if he says he wants to do something he wants to fix twitter and make it wechat i i believe it to yeah. me that's an easy problem versus spacex if he wants to make uh optimus uh, mm -hmm. uh flip burgers i believe it <laughs> right so so it, it's just the future it's just so amazingly bright 
because of what this one man has driven, right? And I, I, we we can obviously see your uh, your your a big fanboy as I am, but but uh, your yours is uh, supported by a lot more data and research than mine. So this I'm, has been I, incredible. Yeah, I may have gone too far. I drove to Texas from Florida to watch the Starship test launch. <laughs> you know, I've, I've so, done a lot of. I've driven forty thousand miles on my Model X in a year. Um, hey. That's one thing on top of you at. I, I'm at almost 60,000 in two years. Well, two years on my okay. Y. I'm slowing and down. My, my daughter and I, <laughs> we, we, drove, uh, we drove to Austin. We tried to get into the, the factory um, and uh, it was blocked off. But we, we explained to the security guard and he allowed us to go in and we took a couple of pictures in, in near the yep. factory. So, nice. so yeah, it, it was fun.